Uh, good evening, friends. Uh, welcome to uh, the evening, Tuesday evening sessions of uh, Critical Care and Emergency Academics from Yasoda Group of Hospitals. Uh, we are happy and um, pleased to actually bring this um, interesting, updated, and new topics, uh, which will uh, probably help us in understanding these concepts also. Uh, to explore that, we have today Dr. Karthik Munta, who is a senior consultant in the Department of Critical Care Medicine in Yasoda Hospital, Samajiguda. He will bring us a review of uh, artificial intelligence in current uh, scenarios and also in COVID pandemic. And we have Dr. BJ Rajesh, uh, who has been working on this uh, artificial intelligence. He's by his core profession, a senior neurosurgeon uh, and spine surgeon in um, Yasoda Hospital, Sikindrabad. So he has a lot of uh, keen work in uh, um, artificial intelligence. I happened to actually witness one of his uh, uh, academic CME program, which he was actually conducting on artificial intelligence. So we are glad to have both of you, sir. Thank you for being with us and spending some time. So without wasting time, I will request Dr. Karthik to take us through the um, artificial intelligence role in current critical care medicine and its future vision. Over to you, Dr. Karthik. Thank you, Dr. Venkat. Uh, I hope my screen is visible to you all. Now, please share your screen. So, how long, Dr. BJ Rajesh, uh, till uh, uh, Dr. Karthik opens up his slides? How long you have been associated with this artificial intelligence? Why do you thought in medical profession? To be honest to you, uh, AI being a fancy word for many of our IT colleagues and uh, my engineering friends, but uh, in medical gadgets, uh, it being a new phenomenon. And why you get attracted to this? There are two. There are two things. One is, uh, uh, I don't know how it's there in terms of medicine, other areas. Uh, let us take simple example, stethoscope, treatments. Yeah. Okay. Then you, uh, when we come to our uh, surgical instruments, most of the instruments are based on the name of one famous surgeon. Okay, It's not a technician, it's a famous surgeon. Now, just look back and understand why it is on the name of a surgeon or not a technician not a technologist. The reason is clinician has devoted some time to develop it along with the technology colleagues, which is why most of the, uh, say, surgeons or others in the Western world or doctors or whatever it is, they are in active collaboration with technology guys to develop this kind of products which we use. Let me tell you an example regarding the high-end cars. They employ orthopedicians and sports when they design a car. Well, let it be a motorbike or a car. The big companies, they employ uh, doctors. They take their opinion, they design it. The problem with us is we are not doing it. That is the first reason. And uh, we are always dependent upon Western world to have innovative products. And unfortunately, all the Western world uh, the high-end technology, most of them are traveling from India, settling in Western countries, and they're working with those teams, and they're developing, and they're selling back products to us. So we have very great minds in technology part. We have great minds in medical part. But the problem, what is happening is, both of us are not merging here. In fact, they're merging in Western countries under Western banner, and they're coming and selling. For example, Google CEO, India. They employ Indians. Uh, the data which is being uh, Google glasses, which can predict uh, hypertension, diabetes, and other things. The data is all from Indian patients' data. So patients' data is Indian. The technology innovation is Indian. The company is led by an Indian, but it's sold on a Western banner, and it's sold in India again. So everything is asked why the other person has to do. So, so that, the reason that, is we that, are not merging with them. That is the reason behind your actual initiativeness and all. That's the first thing. The second yeah. thing is, uh, for last 20 years when I've been working, 
uh, I've seen a lot of paraplegic patients who come to us. We may just save their life by doing surgeries, but uh, uh, after a few years, they come and they tell, sir, please, be, please make me walk. So with that concept, I thought, uh, why not we do something? And then I worked on exoskeleton. I realized exoskeleton is around one and a half to two crores. So with my technology friend, we went to one center, studied it, and we started developing by ourselves. We realized, why not we develop by ourselves? Then when we started developing, it was looking a Herculean task. I needed a lot of AI modules. So then with great effort, I got into contact with the one professor from IIT Hyderabad, who is probably a father of AI in India, way back in 1985 started. Then after six months to one year, got his contact. Then I went and spoke with him. So what is one and a half crore? He told we can do it within 10 lakhs. So that is the stimulation. Then I realized uh, say computer, like when we grew up, computer internet was a big thing. And even now I don't know much about computer. The reason is we have not shown interest to it. We are totally focused on medical field. So now the computer digitization is gone. Now it's all AI, understand? So it is must for every doctor to understand AI and show some interest. In fact, I keep giving talks and uh, everywhere I keep telling that uh, every doctor has to spend five to 10% of time into research. If they do, you, we can do a lot of innovative things, a lot of innovative products. So that's the reason why actually I started a nonprofit organization called Association of Artificial Intelligence and Healthcare. So it's a platform where it will integrate the entire uh, persons who want to develop AI and health tech, uh, right from ideation till uh, a product delivery to consumer. So with that concept, I tied up with all technology institutes. I gave talks in all technology institutes in and around Hyderabad. And we have multiple projects we are doing with uh, different groups. Uh, in fact, one concerning with our intensive care we have done, I was talking about the oxygen th saving thing. We'll discuss it later. I think probably after Karthik's talk, we can have a discussion as and when it goes ahead. Okay. Uh, uh, nice to see you, sir. We will have more interaction with you. First, over to you, Dr. Karthik. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, it's a great privilege coming back with an interesting... Please turn your uh, camera. Okay. You are still your video is uh, your video is not visible. Am I now visible, sir? No, his slides are visible. Sir, uh, let's finish the presentation. Okay. Uh, then, uh, are you able to see my presentation? Yeah, yeah. Okay, fine. Uh, right, sir. Okay. I'll start off my presentation. Uh, so, the artificial intelligence, as Dr. Rajesh had uh, mentioned earlier is an innovative and a very interesting topic. And it's, uh, as Dr. Rajesh also suggested that each one of us have to know some uh, idea, have some idea about this uh, evolving technology. Like we have so many technologies that have been coming up like nanomolecular technology, then biotechnology, and we have uh, uh, computing, robotic computing. Likewise, we do have this innovation, uh, which is called uh, um, artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is a very broad topic. Like uh, uh, we, we have a very restricted minds. Like if, if an intensivist does a night call shift, uh, 
according to this paper it's a very interesting paper and i would uh, like each one of you to go through this paper it was presented at nobel prize symposium so this was about the limitation of human cognition and when they uh, published this paper it was very interesting to see that they categorically uh, mentioned saying that an intensivist during a night call shift uh, he observes or he takes care of nearly 236 variable categories so such is the cognition skills that an intensivist needs to have so uh, having this much of cognition capabilities is a very very daunting task and it's very difficult so the um, artificial intelligence makes this a possibility in the near future so what are the uh, subcategories or domains we have or let us start with how we can define artificial intelligence artificial intelligence is defined as a development of computer systems that are capable of performing tasks that are normally that normally requires human intelligence what are these uh, capabilities the capability of decision making solving complex problems and increasing the accuracy the repeatability and increasing the accuracy of the solutions and at the same time performing a high level computations so these are some of the uh, tasks that an artificial intelligence uh, needs to deliver in order to achieve the required results so if we have to say the what are the main domains of artificial intelligence if we have to talk about artificial intelligence then the artificial intelligence as we have discussed has an immense potential uh, as we have seen the symposium paper the psychologists also mentioned that we cannot a, a human cannot uh, monitor more than four independent variables so if we go on to the fifth variable we get lost so our short term memory is very restricted so the artificial intelligence comes in handy and it has a potential to rescue the doctors especially from the data overload that going to face in the near future and the frontline community worker like doctors in india if they disagree or do not show interest in development of this field and definitely you would be having a presence of another person who would be taking care of this and certainly we don't want this because we understand science better and we would like to develop the technology that is related to the medical science with our own experience the next slide please So, if we go to the history of artificial intelligence, the word artificial intelligence was coined in 1950, and in 1956, Alan Turing, who was the mathematician for the United Kingdom, had come up with this principle or the concept of artificial intelligence, which he had envisioned in the future to caper, cater to the ever-growing uh, technology, which would help in making decisions. what differentiates an artificial technology or artificial intelligence from a soft computing skills that we all possess nowadays is the capability of decision making the capability of decision making the capability of increasing the accuracy and the capability of learning that is what is special in this artificial technology in the year 1960 uh, the first uh, lab that was dedicated to development of uh, artificial intelligence was set up in the Uh, Massachusetts Institute of Technology and in 1960 the uh, computer software programs which are capable enough in playing chess so the use of artificial intelligence started off with the games in form of checkers and uh, in form of chess and in uh, 1961 the first time the chatbot was uh, invented now chatbot is nothing but it's a kind of uh, whatsapp kind of a technique where the the one end the computer talks to you and the other end you are the person who are trying to take information this is kind of technology that we day in day use whenever we want to contact the customer care executive in an amazon or we want to contact any customer care executive on netflix in 97 this was a landmark uh, year wherein the artificial intelligence provided the deep blue computer which had uh, defeated the uh, world reigning uh, grand grandmaster caspro and the use or the influence of the artificial intelligence came into the limelight and in 2005 the deep neural networks and their application in medical field started and in 2011 here we are with ever increasing artificial intelligence literature coming into the current scenario the next slide please so if you have to maze basically divide into the domains of artificial intelligence artificial intelligence can be broadly classified into the six domains which includes machine learning deep learning robotics the expert systems 
fuzzy, fuzzy logic and natural language processing. Now, these are all terms that we are not acquainted. These are new to us and we need to understand these things. Why is it important to understand these concepts? Because the artificial intelligence and their application medicine revolves around the techniques or the models through which the questions, the answers that we are uh, hoping to get from the clinical questions are answered with. So I will not try to be technical in my presentation. I will try to be as brief and as simple as possible and try to explain what these terminologies are. Now, there is a process of biostatistics, which we all are aware of. We use terminologies like kaplan Meier graph, forest plot, etc., etc. Those are statistical terms that are biostatistical terms. But there is another branch which is called bioinformatics. This bioinformatics take help of the AI technologies and uh, they inculcate the uh, medical aspects into this uh, uh, te uh, technical terms and try to find a clinical answer to the problem on our hand. Now, what is machine learning? Now, machine learning is a process wherein the data that is being given to the system is processed and the computer learns the language that you're speaking to it. Like for a simple example, if I take the Siri that all of us use on our Apple products is that is a technology that inculcates this process of machine learning. So the machine learning basically takes your voice commands, try to recognize you and try to ask what question that you are trying to elicit answer for. And then it passes on to a module. Now that module is nothing but the deep learning modules that are there, which includes your artificial neural networks, the convoluted uh, neural networks, which answer the complicated questions. These are the deep learning modules where your analytical thinking and the answers to your questions are framed or derived upon. The robotics are a branch wherein these uh, ro uh, humanoid robots that are now the Sophia, the so-called the Sophia robots that we are seeing, the technology of robots in performing the derived result, the whatever you have learned from a machine learning, whatever you have assessed the result that you are in, uh, intending to get has to be uh, made into a practical form, which helps with the help of your robotic AI. Expert systems try to get answers through the software, which are highly complex uh, material and uh, lesser used in our medical field. Now, fuzzy logic. Fuzzy logic is another domain of uh, AI. In, in, in any field, we don't have black and white. We have fields of gray wherein the answer does not lie as yes or a no. There are some questions which need to be answered with approximation. So whenever we are asking a clinical question which includes approximation, then we take the concept of fuzzy logic and try to find an answer. That is also a domain of AI. And the last but not the least is the natural language processing. So this inculcates the tendencies of uh, identifying the written language, identifying the uh, verbal language and tries to uh, learn and tries to derive the intended result. The simple example is your Twitter and Facebook. So whenever you answer a question to the Twitter, uh, the answer sometimes may not be uh, legally uh, allowed in some countries. So the way the, uh, the Twitter uh, works is through comprehending such uh, malicious um, uh, messages that are put on Twitter and it it has this artificial intelligence technique which uses this natural language processing and tries to delete such messages. So these are some of the broad categories of AI and their applications in non-medical fields. Now when you come to the broad classification of artificial intelligence, artificial intelligence has a uh, machine learning at the top of the tree which has two types of learning which are supervised and unsupervised. Now, these are some terminologies which are very, very basic, which are very, very important for us to know when we try to read papers which are based on artificial intelligence. Now, the methods of artificial intelligence includes use of these terminologies. Therefore, it is very important for us to know what these terminologies are and what terminology we need to use or what type of technology we need to use to get answers to our clinical questions. Now, if you take the first example of supervised artificial intelligence. Supervised artificial intelligence is that kind of a domain where we are taking data which are labeled. 
like you are thinking about a chest x-ray you are thinking about a ct scan these are labeled data you are feeding computer thousand chest x-rays or a thousand ct scans and you are trying to derive an answer around the chest x-ray uh, diagnosis around the ct scan diagnosis then such types of intelligence artificial intelligence requiring software work on the superficial uh, supervised uh, machine learning now if you talk about a cluster of data which do not have labeled content like you could give a database of 1 lakh patients and you don't mention what kind of database it is whether it is the height weight sex age blood pressure or any variable but you give a, a mix of data to the computer then computer starts analyzing this data and the results of this data are little difficult to interpret so such kind of uh, use of such kind of artificial intelligence is needed in certain fields where we have clustering of data to be done we have to detect an anomaly which is rare or we have to have a dimensional reduction we need to see the data in a view that we are intending to see then we use this unsupervised artificial intelligence now next slide please so this is what we have learned so far the machine learning now this is a simple example where we use siri in a day to day life so when you talk to the siri siri identifies your language identifies your modulation then it decodes and sends to the server across the california and the desired output like in this example we are asking where the nearest subway is then the machine has to detect that it is you who are speaking then it has to answer that question which is where the subway is nearest to you and then it has to send back an answer to you now there is different steps of process that occurs in this machine learning now in the machine learning as we have discussed the supervised and unsupervised data and we have talked about the labeled data and unlabeled data and within supervised data we have different classifications like the regression model the classification model the bayesian model the random forest model neural networks and vector mechanics these are terminologies you will be coming across the papers when you read about artificial intelligence and unsupervised data is basically helps you in anomaly detection clustering and dimensional reduction the next slide please so this is a simple example of supervised learning and labeled data you have a clutter of cutlery on your hand and you are telling the computer that you have two products in them that is one spoon and one knife so the computer keeps learning different sizes of spoon and knife so you have labeled your data and you are asking the computer whether this is a spoon or whether this is a knife this is a simple example of a supervised learning and how you apply it the next slide please so the next types of supervised learning are classification and regression models classification is when you have two categorical variables to determine whether it is yes or no or regression when you want to see two independent variables how one variable changes affecting the other variable the next slide please this is a simple example of classification model of supervised learning the spam filters that we use in our email is a classical example so whenever a spam mail comes to your mail you try to the computer tries to learn what a spam is what it tries to pick up some words like free like your account or your contact so these are some terminology it keeps keeps on learning whenever you spam any email so think about thousands of users or lakhs of users across the world when they are send, sending those emails to spam bins these are learned by the system and tries to automatically detect when your new email is a spam or a non spam this is why sometimes when we get mail and you say you have not got a mail the people say you please check your spam mail whether the mail has gone there so this is a simple artificial intelligence that is used now regression models are used when two independent variables are being used and you want to see the relation between these two variables how one variable affects an another variable like in this example you want to see how the humidity affects the temperature and how the temperature affects humidity if my temperature goes up whether the humidity will go up or will be less this is especially in the meteorological departments this is used to see how the movements of your hurricane will occur so how the hurricane will move in the coming two days this is used with help of your supervised learning with help of regression models this is one of the implications of your artificial intelligence next slide please so the superficial learning like we have uh, talked about till now can be helpful in risk assessment studies so if you are doing any study which is on risk assessment 
or if you are doing any study on fraud detection or you want to do a study on visual recognition like in ophthalmological branches we use lot of retinopathy uh, diagnosis is done by artificial intelligence nowadays with your smartphones this takes the supervised learning into account and the image classification like x ray like you are feeding computer with ct scans you are trying to find out the pathological diagnosis to your problem then the image classification model works on your supervised learning excellent the unsupervised learning we have talked about is basically upon cluster modeling and uh, anomaly detection this is nothing but you give your database and you try to find out those patterns which are not in your realm of your domain of cognizance so you are finding some new diseases you are finding some new uh, uh, associations between different pathological uh, findings then you want to use a unsupervised learning but you have to be very cautious of the results that you get from unsupervised learning regarding their usage and you have to do an uh, reinforcement study for this unsupervised learning in order to get a desirable result next slide please so next slide please this is something called a deep neural network so when you go through many papers many of those papers are based on the deep neural network of analytical thinking so these are a model of analytical thinking after the machine learns the data and modifies the data this goes into the second stage where it is the analytical thinking occurs with help of deep neural networks what are deep neural networks these are nothing but they ape or they 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 mirror the uh, neuron pattern in your brain so in our brain there are many layers of neuron so when you see an animal like a dog how do you differentiate with the cat is with the signals which go at the different levels likewise in the computing technology as well there are different layers of uh, classifier models so this is one example of a classifier models wherein there are three variables the analytical thinking occurs with a different combination of permutations and output is got now suppose this classifier model there are multiple classifier models that have to be taken into account in order to get the desired result then we use the deep neural technology the next one so this is a neural network which has a different layers it has an input layer the hidden layer and outer layer physically this is how the the chipsets are managed in those technologies wherein you feed the input and the input goes and analytical thinking occurs in different layers and the output is generated this is called as a forward propagation or a deep neural network technology the next slide next slide now this is the technical part of uh ai this is very important this is very basic so i took some time in uh trying to simplify it and trying to present uh, in a simplified way i hope yeah, i have simplified as far as possible to my understanding now let us see uh, can you go back to the one slide back please yes so let us see what are the utilizations of this um, uh, artificial intelligence pertaining to the critical care artificial intelligence is used across your medical field but my talk is basically upon the critical care applications so if i have to say the applications of artificial intelligence in critical care then the applications can be divided into mainly these four domains like the prediction analysis the personalizing treatment care the decision support making and the use of new types of data and their interpretation so most of our critical care papers come across this four headings so let us go one by one let us take the prediction analysis next slide please so there has been ever increasing increase in the research in artificial intelligence and critical care so if you see the publications in critical care especially using artificial technology there has been a boom from 2014 onwards it has gone exponentially it has been like a share market uh, bull run where the graph has gone very high in a very short span of time so this is the importance that is being attributed to the artificial technology especially in critical care and if you see the research that is coming out of the western literature most prominently even in our country there have been many artificial models that have been built up which helps us in simplifying our critical care work especially in a background where the number of variables that we need to address are very very high the next slide please so the prediction model is the first uh, model wherein we use prediction studies now this is the first paper i would like to discuss wherein the investigators had used artificial intelligence in order to predict 
whether a patient who is coming into hospital, if we had a chest X-ray of this patient on the day of admission, whether this patient would require a ventilator support in his stay or not. This is a very valid and very valid question to ask, especially in this scenario that we have already hopefully gone through and come out victorious, wherein our resources were very, very limited. We had our limited resources. We had ever increasing patients. We had to take care of sick cases. Then such kind of artificial intelligence, which uses, utilizes these deep learning models, which we have discussed earlier, can predict whether this patient that is entering to my hospital might require a ventilator support or do I have the ventilator to manage those cases? They have compared the they have compared the analysis between the clinician at level of patient and the AI policy, which used uh, the prediction at the level of the chest X-ray image, and they found that it was as good as the clinician prediction and the usage of AI in determining whether the use of ventilator will be there or not was proven to be successful. And this is one way we can triage our hospital resources for our admitted cases of COVID-19 prominently. And we conceptualize, use this tool and rationally use our resources. So the next slide, please. This is a second type of prediction model wherein they have used the natural language processing and machine learning as their tools in determining whether the diagnosis of ARDS can be made by the serial chest X-rays. So what they have done is a retrospective study and they have made a test data set wherein they have used 24 hours of radiology reports and they have fed the artificial intelligence system with these thousands of reports. And with the help of these reports, the computer um, converted this written format into audio format and it has already, it also picked up the keywords out of, the, out of this radiology reports and try to uh, generate a, a analytical network on its own by trial and error. And it tried to suggest what is the percentage of patients who would be having ARDS. So if we present uh, this system with the chest X-ray and the reporting of the chest X-ray, it could accurately predict approximately up to 80%, which is as good as it gets about regarding the diagnosis of your ARDS. Traditionally, the diagnosis accuracy was 673 but when your artificial intelligence was used, the diagnosis accuracy increased to 80.2% with a positive predictive value of 62.5%. So this is only with your reporting and the machine learning the reports and trying to give an analytical thinking, seeing the chest X-ray report, whether this patient could have an ARDS or not. Next slide, please. So that was about the prediction capabilities of artificial intelligence. Now coming to the personalizing treatment approach. Now we can use artificial intelligence in personalizing treatment. This is the era of precision medicine. Now the concept of precision medicine revolves around one treatment does not fit to everyone. So there are different sex of patients. There are people who are obese, who are lean. There are patients who are male, female. You need to personally give a precision medicine, precision treatment, depending on the background condition, depending on their presentations. And it also helps in therapeutic research, especially. So this is, next slide, please. This is one of the examples where the therapeutic precision will help you with help of artificial intelligence. Take, for example, this is a study that was conducted in, in the fields of vaccination. Now, all of us know the need for the COVID vaccines, the the urgency for us to have a vaccination trial completed fast, and we know what are emergency approvals, et cetera, et cetera. But think, this is, this is artificial intelligence which would have helped you in deriving results to these clinical trials. So all of us know when a vaccine goes through a clinical trial, you have uh, uh, animal studies, phase one, phase two, phase three, phase four. What if we had a study which was done in a finite group of patients and then we get to extrapolate data in simulation lab and try to see what would be the results if we go for a phase three and phase four trials and the reproducibility accuracy of those reports. This is what is precision or this is what is the decision making that the artificial intelligence will help you in determining. If you want to speed up your vaccination, if you want to speed up with your results of phase three, phase four, how it will be uh, depending on the artificial intelligence learning of the system, this you could speed up the uh, results of your vaccination with help of your 
uh, artificial intelligence uh, develop your personalized medicine with help of the emerging technologies with the data and in IT infrastructure that is available with you. So this is one example where uh, artificial intelligence helps us in precision medicine. The third domain where in critical care, uh, the artificial intelligence will help you is this is the most important one is the decision support. So as an intensivist, you're looking at different variables. You want the systems to help you to unload or off burden your uh, decision making capabilities. So your decision cap uh, capabilities are limited to a limited amount of time. So you need help of these uh, artificial intelligence systems in making a precise and a confirmed decision in order to support your diagnosis and treatment. So in this domain, there are many papers that have been published in field of critical care. One such paper is in the field of sepsis. The next slide, please. So this is the application of artificial intelligence and uh, in delivering optical, optimal treatment strategies for sepsis in intensive care. So if you see through the research that has been done in intensive care in the field of AI, most of the articles are revolved around the sepsis and the sepsis related management. So what they have done in this study is they've given the patient input data, uh, which comprises of 48 features, like different clinical and lab related parameters and the medication patterns and the patient outcomes. And this used a system of learning called the reinforcement learning. So reinforcement learning is a type of artificial intelligence which is done in simulation labs with help of a training set of data and the reinforcement uh, learning needs to be implemented prospectively. If you, have a pro if you have a process which is going prospectively and uh, which is having ethical bias, then we use with help of reinforcement learning how this would help me in determining the diagnosis. So in this study, when they use this principle of AI and try to answer the question, regarding how better we can deal with our sepsis management. Then they came up with this answer that the machines with the AI policy had, uh, had uh, given an answer saying that the increasing the vasopressor support or initializing the vasopressor support early with judicious usage, usage of fluids. So if you cut down your fluids and try to use vasopressors early, the outcomes were better. Now this comes out of uh, vast data and uh, it comes out of uh, reinforcement learning and this was again implemented by physicians and they used the AI policy that was generated and they found the benefits, the outcomes to be far, far superior than the clinical decision making. Next slide, please. This was another interesting study which in critical care day in day off, we use the sedation management protocols that we use and uh, the sedation management protocols have the problems of uh, uh, the dosage, what dose is right, sedative dose, and uh, if the dose is high, then we have changes in the uh, hemodynamic stability that is occurring. So the artificial intelligence tried to answer this question, and with use of artificial intelligence, it could maintain uh, the hemodynamic stability, and it was uh, managing sedation with a lesser amount of drugs. So 8% betterment in the managing sedation and 26% betterment in maintaining hemodynamic stability was the end result when compared to a clinical decision making with help of artificial intelligence. So this is one of the indications where we can use artificial intelligence in day out, day in, day out in decision making in uh, critical care. The next slide, please. And this is an interesting paper where the artificial neural network models, that is what we have uh, talked about uh, in the previous slides, wherein we have classifier models in different layers. And when this artificial neural network was used for predicting whether my extubation is a, will be a successful or not, and they have compared the artificial intelligence derived data with help of the traditional methods, like the test score or the mean expiratory pressure or the rapid shallow index, and they've seen that it is 85% accuracy. The precision is nearly 93.9%. Such high is the predictability of your artificial network, artificial intelligence, when compared to your traditional models of extubation. So this is another example that we can classically quote for your decision making. Next slide, please. Now the next domain is the using the new types of data with help of artificial intelligence. Next slide. Now, we 
uh, have a problem of delirium we see day in day out of our patients patients do not have orientation of time they do not have orientation whether it's morning or evening and they are having multiple drugs going on and delirium incidence is increasing in the icus and uh, delirium causes increase in the length of icu stay so how can we address this problem with help of artificial intelligence so they have used the technology of pervasive sensing and deep learning now we know what is deep learning we have discussed about it pervasive sensing is something like your facial recognition like when you go to punch in your attendance and when you see the iris scan the facial module detection this all take the pervasive sensing methods and when you apply the pervasive sensing with help of deep learning techniques then the incidence of delirium and detection of delirium is made easy so the ai has a sensors of probes this is how the future of your icu can look also you could have a light sensor at the back of your bed a sound sensor a physiological variable signals monitor and you could have an accelerometer to your hand now most of us have smart watches most of us have an apple watch detects and detects how the pattern of your sleep has been it has an accelerometer in it and it tells you how many times you have turned left and you have how many turns times you have turned right and with help of this uh, uh, pain level monitors with help of facial recognition you could come to a derivation or you can derive on the percentage or the incidence of delirium that is occurring in your patient and ai could warn the doctors or could uh, inform the doctors that the patient might be experiencing delirium at least in the coming days the, the prediction is far earlier than the clinical prediction that occurs in the icu this is one type of using the data now the next type where the uh, the, uh, the artificial intelligence might play a futuristic role is use of artificial intelligence especially in futuristic telemedicine and robotics especially this was used more in this covid-19 era covid-19 has taught us many lessons many places that we could not go the number of times that we could visit the patient all of them have been limited all have been restricted so when you utilize this technology like artificial intelligence it could off button your problems it could provide uh, uh, medical uh, support to the patients who are far away from uh, health facilities and also a uh, part of your treatment diagnosis prediction of the severity of the covid infection could have been achieved with help of this telemedicine and when you mix telemedicine with your artificial intelligence then the the numbers of the results are astronomically higher so the robotic assistant tele telemedicine wherein the uh, ai uses the information of the periphery and it it, it tries to divert the Uh, information to the appropriate centers where the uh, information can be transferred or the patient can be transferred can be attained with help of this robotic assisted telemedicine and the telemedicine organizational frameworks were designed with help of this technology so these are the broad category of applications of artificial intelligence in critical care now if i have to conclude my presentation what i have made in past 15 minutes or 20 minutes to say uh i would say that the icu doctors are often required to analyze large volumes which are complex and uh, heterogeneous data to make life critical decisions if we use ai effectively it could reduce this burden by transforming data into more actionable information rather than a vague information thereby the adverse outcomes would be decreased and highly manageable complex situations could be made easily possible to manage and we could spend lesser time on analytical thinking and there is a, a limitation to the application of ai wherein the doctors feel that the machines could replace the doctors or medical fraternity which is not the case because the data ultimately is required for any artificial intelligence to work and this data has to come from a, a clinical perspective point of view and this will only help us in uh, reducing the burden and decision making and make our analytical thinking more productive and reach to far outreach of the patients so with this few slides i would like to rest my presentation here and i would like to thank uh, management of yashoda dr pavan and dr venkat for giving me this opportunity to speak with you people on this interesting topic thank you kartik uh, for that quick and um, lucid uh, presentation um you actually brought some interesting areas uh, i think we have been going through this uh, unprecedented pandemic for the last one and a half year 
we have gone through many uh, shortages, uh, many surges, and maybe we have overburdened with many situations. In those situations, monitoring these uh, multiple points uh, or these multiple parameters, analyzing them, maybe addressing them was uh, over more complex in during this pandemic. So I think th that again made many of our clinicians to think about uh, many paramedical staff or the other colleagues to cross uh, train critical care in the same way we thought of maybe our uh, EI should come into our rescue in somewhere or other monitoring these cases uh, in remote way. So I think uh, with this, uh, we will uh, take on to some uh, interesting uh, charts. So, sir, you are actually talking about uh, AI and it's your association, and you are also talking about you have an organization uh, which actually is a non profitable AI organization in healthcare system. Uh, also, you spoke about exoskeleton in the beginning of uh, this. Actually, I happened to see this exoskeleton in one of the rehab centers almost eight years back. And when they quoted that um, uh, exoskeleton of one crore, and I also happened to see a simulation SIM3 lab, which actually simulates like a patient and uh, you can actually um, uh, create a clinical scenarios um, from a SIM lab. So these are the examples which I've seen during this period, uh, but what, what is your take? Uh, I think with the overview of Karthik in predicting decision-making, um, maybe processing this information to a cumulative some quality outcome products and many things which we spoke about. What do you think, where do we stand right now, uh, at least in the context of critical care and medical science and uh, what will be our future vision, uh, Dr. Rajesh? Thanks, Dr. Ankar. Uh, in words, a succinct and uh, uh, in detail presentation by Karthik, uh, there are a few things we have to remember. Uh, one is uh, in Indian context, it, uh, we are still long way ahead. See, uh, as I rightly pointed out, AI is going to solve the big data, which will take long time. We or even the routine present computers take a long time, and AI is going to give solution to that. It's not that it's going to make big wonders and all. It's a gradual process. It's an evolving process. And uh, it's going to evolve. And we will be living with AI in the coming decades. There's no doubt about it. Now, how we are going to apply and how we are going to use is a question mark. And the biggest problem in Indian context, especially when we see, is the data. Now, for AI to work, you need data. Now, that data has to be structured data. So let us see what are the structured data we have. We have structured data where it can be digitized and stored. So right now it's only the imaging, especially radiology and electrophysiological data. These are only two things where it is it can be stored easily. Now once that is stored, extracting information, collecting, and it's very easy. Now we don't have EHRs, electronic electronic health records or EMRs. So if we have EMS, our data, health data, patient clinical data will be very good. Now, uh, let us see like in our case sheets, it's extremely difficult to get, understand the data from that transfer and study. In fact, uh, Niti Aayog has uh, taken up this as a big challenge and it has instructed uh, some of the technology institutes putting in huge money, trying to work on a system to get a proper information from the written data. So some of the institutes are working right on it, but that is our biggest hurdle. So that's the reason why we see most of the times the AI we are working in areas of radiology or pathology, and uh, probably in say uh, EEG where the EEG or ECG, or uh, now in uh, intensive care, all the digital parameters. Now, uh, the, definitely these are going to make a big difference. The second point is the biggest fear what most of us feel is uh, we lose our jobs, especially the radiologists feel that we, are lo we lose our jobs. But if you see the World Economic Forum has predicted there'll be loss of 85 million jobs by 2025 because of AI. But the same forum tells that they're going to create 95 million jobs by 25. The point is we, what we need to understand most of us, AI is not going to replace us we have to get adapted to the new technology, that's all. So we can utilize our time more efficiently in a much difficult task. The simpler task 
can be thrown away to AI and a difficult task can be taken up by this one. Now, uh, one of the areas I thought uh, Dr. Karthik has missed is the uh, remote monitoring systems, the IoT devices in the ICU settings. Uh, especially in Indian context, if you see a lot of the ICUs in small uh, uh, two tier or three tier cities where a good quality intensive is not available, the IoT devices is definitely going to make a big difference. Where, uh, uh, in fact, there is one uh, organization which is a startup which has come up in India, Cloud Physicians, where what they do is they tie up with all the two tier and three tier uh, city small hospitals. And uh, through cloud, they can get the data and they do telemedicine. So that is one thing where especially the intensive care uh, is being taken up. So these are the key things. And third thing is AI is a fascinating word. Big data is a fascinating word. And it's not that easy that once you prepare and then you can easily apply it everywhere. Now, the, once you develop AI product on say some module, uh, as data keeps growing, it refines. So what is the limitation where you stop? Like an example, statistically, if you do some study, as per statistics, you say you need to have minimum number of 50 patients for this particular study to come. Yes, yeah, still that does not evolve. So what uh, slowly la over last two, three years, a new concept which has come up is AI product managers. So their duty is to see how AI product runs after it's being deployed. Say once it is sold, and once it's deployed, you need to nourish or, uh, uh, the AI product with the new data, a different kind of data which is coming up as we see more number of patients. There can be multiple variables which come in and their duty is to account with that and see that the software works well. So uh, like you have shown that Google, Siri showing directions and all, at the same time, there have been instances where Google has misdirected. So that's because it did not get a proper data. We see in WhatsApp messages where car getting trapped within two walls in a small narrow lane. That's because the data is not updated. So it's not the problem if AI, but it's problem the data. Because if data is not properly given to AI, it will misguide. So it's still an evolving stage, but it's going to change. In fact, uh, one of the places where what is called as Moore's law, uh, that was given sometime in 1960s, if I'm not wrong. So it stated that the digitization, the computer digitization is going to double every two years. It stood in the same way for almost 50 years. But with emergence AI, it is, uh, this doubling has gone to every three months. So that is a pace with which a lot of people are working in AI and a lot of things are happening. Now, the basic thing for that is you need a structured data. We lack it in India. In fact, we have started one project for uh, A and the screening. Now, only once I started, I realized that we have different types of mammogram machines and uh, A has to understand all the different kinds of mammogram. If I develop with the 3D mammogram, which is developed in high end, and if I do it, I cannot use it in other level mammogram. In the same way, let us take in the ICU settings, if we develop some kind of system where we can predict uh, uh, the, based on the parameters which are available on the digital monitor. Now, how we are going to acquire the, mon uh, the data from that monitor and that monitor data, how it's going to work in this AI, different monitors, whether it will work same or it will be different, the type of data, what we are going to put in. So all these things matter. There's a lot of complexities which are involved, so, but uh, it's just a matter of time as we grow, the, the small, small things can get solved. Now, regarding my organization, it is an uh, organization which has started two years back, uh, but unfortunately the COVID uh, came and it's not progressing as much as what we thought. But this is uh, nothing but a platform where we'll uh, encourage uh, all the healthcare uh, uh, people who want to develop technology with AI, we'll support them right from ideation till the delivery of the product at the consumer level. because. Uh, when I started uh, this project, as you were telling, I was talking about the exoskeleton. It took almost six to nine months to get to one professor who is supposedly a so-called father of AI in India, who started way back in 1985, Professor Vidya Sagar. 
who is right now heading BTEC uh, AI in our country in uh, IIT Hyderabad. That's a, the first institute in the country which has started AI as BTEC. Otherwise, AI right now is only at, at a MTEC level. So it took a lot of time for me to get in touch with him and also get in. In fact, I gave talks at all the technology institutes. And it took a lot of time for me to get in contact and try to understand who is doing what. So I just imagine if suppose one of you is having a thought, so you don't know where to go, how to go, how to approach it. So that was the basis with which we started. So this platform, I can support anyone who comes with some concept. I know this person in this institute is doing it. So that I can link it up and he can come and help you discuss and subsequently say, the uh, marketing strategy or business strategy, how to deploy, so all those things. So, so it's a platform where we'll integrate everyone and uh, support, uh, right? Say, uh, at times you get with one good product, but you have problem in uh, financing it. So we'll get, uh, there are many venture capitalists who work only on uh, health tech. There are many venture capitalists who work only on AI and health tech. So we'll try to connect it to them and see that they get funded and they'll pay for it the product forward. So that is how we have designed our uh, AIC. Yeah, thank you, uh, Dr. Rajesh for that. I think uh, what actually emphasized is uh, we have great minds, um, we have great data, uh, we have, uh, uh, I think uh, the, the patients, their um, information, but no structured way we are storing them or we are creating them and from there, uh, we also know uh, Indians as great brains, but uh, they are not uh, actively involved here. And you said ki the artificial intelligence has an integral part of a medical system where medical professional has to be involved. And they have to provide this all inputs uh, to make it happen. Uh, so Dr. Karthik, what do you think if I uh, come to again back to intensive care unit, what do you think, where do we should start at least? Um, uh, as he said, if any of us are interested in AI, so which are the things as he spoke about remote monitoring system, you spoke about the mechanical ventilation, you spoke about the picking up of uh, the alerting signs. So where, where should we start and uh, what, what should be the, our way forward in intensive care? Uh, so uh, basically in ICU structure scenario, most of the research that has been done is on the prediction models. Now prediction models basically revolve around the uh, length of ICU stays, the outcomes. You know, when our patients attend us ask you, what is the number of days that the patient would require to stay in ICU? Or when they ask you, what are the chances that my patient will improve? And what are they, what is my hospital stay going to be like when I come with certain amount of problems? These are some questions which we answer on basis on a single score or we answer depending upon the presentation parameters and we try to judge. If you see something score like Apache, if you see something like a SOFA score, there's a point of time scoring and they predict in the future. But AI is something which is dynamic, which goes every day, which keeps on learning every day and it is trained to see where there is an error. A trial and error has been done and the machine has corrected itself. So definitely its prediction are going to be much, much superior than your score predictions. And especially if I have to start using AI intelligence, what the literature says and what are the simplest way of starting AI usage is in the field of where I could predict what is the length of ICU stay, what are the hospital stay going to be like, outcomes going like. This is where I could start my uh, clinical questions or clinical dilemmas in this field. And slowly we could go into sepsis and predictions of sepsis, predictions of how the disease progression would be. That would be more important and easier things to take up at the time being. And the much uh, sophisticated ones will be taking on to decision supports like uh, ventilator, sedation protocols. They will be in, they'll be in the next step as you'll learn and as the systems uh, improve. In our Indian scenarios, maybe these are the possible ways that we can go in critical care. Uh, the, there is another important point which you actually emphasized is uh, precision medicine and individualizing each patient. You, you may have a protocol in place. Uh, you, you, you may have a um, guidelines in place. I didn't get your question, sir. Uh, what I was trying to say, you spoke about precision medicine. Yes. 
and you also spoke about individualized patients yes yes so in those two things as we know ki there are protocols there are guidelines but uh, as yes. a single patient he may not uh, always fit into the the same patterns for like any other patient every a patient may behave differently one set of protocol one so may not fit all yeah. so in yeah. that area we are now are going towards individualizing patient care uh, precision medicine and all uh, where yeah. do you say ki um, ai can help in those including sepsis yeah. as you said yeah so if if i take that uh, field of precision medicine one size does not fit all that is the motto behind it now if i am treating a patient who is of x kg's weight and another patient who is of y kg's weight definitely and both of them are having say a renal clearance which is decreasing and day in day out for as an intensivist we keep shifting our antibiotic dosages like we shift our antibiotic high cup when the renal clearance improves and we again decrease the dosage of antibiotics depends whether you are dialyzing what time you have to give antibiotics these things could be taken care by precision medicine where the ai could help you in determining what dose would be appropriate for the present giving renal clearance and it could make especially given a, a finite answer to your question uh, depending on this patient how much would be the ideal dose of antibiotic with the background problems and the present condition as on today when compared to another patient who is of different weight different set of problems different organ dysfunctions and uh, whether that drug how much would be in that patient would be different so this is one way i could use a uh, precision medicine with help of ai and try to direct my answers in critical care field yeah. dr bejes rajesh you have been a neurosurgeon okay we have been listening about many robotic surgeries nowadays so we are also li- uh, listening about stereotactic biopsies uh, locating your tumor locating your pathological uh, lesions and all so how are they linked right now and uh, are we not already doing some component of ai or is it different from that many of us are has our own doubts so, uh, you know, th- th- those are not ai the routine robotics is not ai uh, that is simply the tech- mechanical technology now we are slowly developing ai into the robotics it's like what we call it as cognitive robots so that is where is called ai there's a cognition where the robot needs to do intelligent intelligently so the routine robot is not ai it is just a mechanical device uh, where it is making your ease of working from a remote model system so what is the uh, ai in robot is nothing but cognitive robot for example uh, say uh, let us take a, a onco surgeon operating on some tumor in the abdomen now most of the times the presently the robo is being used by onco surgeons or gynec or urologists especially in the abdomen uh, it is much easier large instruments very easy to uh, in neuro we don't have a robo robo is only used for putting screws in the spine or taking biopsies so which is minimum of the surgical skill required in those things whereas in abdomen where they do complex surgeries robo is doing it much precise because you a lot of space so cognitive robot is nothing but we are loading entire imaging data into the system and training the robot that suppose a tumor is there at particular depth uh, there is a vessel there is a nerve or this area you need to coagulate this area is not coagulated so the cognitive robot will tell as i am dissecting i am few mm away from it you need to be careful or you need to you can be aggressive or you need to be ready with a clip to stop the bleeding so that is a cognitive robot so we are coming with cognitive robots uh, uh the other thing is uh, uh, the uh, sensory feedback still now we don't have a sensory feedback in uh, robots uh, i i can't feel the tissue so now there are a lot of sensors which are coming up on the uh, uh, instruments which will give the feel like what we are doing now that is again with ai based and this routine robo is just a mechanical thing there's not much of ai in it uh, in fact one of a neurosurgeon in nimhans is working with triple uh, it bangalore in developing a new kind of robo uh, even our government uh, uh, 
has taken initiative about few months back where we formed a team, a team of uh, probably the technology uh, persons around the premier institutes, the IS people and a few surgeons. And uh, they wanted to start a program to develop indigenous robots. Now, most of the, ro most of the robots are bought from outside and uh, they cost phenomenally. So they want to develop uh, indigenous robots. You now the biggest hurdle to develop in this robo when I was talking with uh, many of the technology persons is the most of the technology institutes want to develop something quick, publish and forget it. It's not that going to take it. So when you come to a surgical robo, you need it has to be invasive. So something invasive, most of the technology institutes are not trained or used to. So that is our biggest hurdle. As I told you, we have very good minds in. Uh, medical field, technology field, everything. But we don't have a system where we can all come together and work. That is not happening. So that is a big hurdle in India to develop an indigenous robo. Uh, but uh, in Western world, cognitive robo is the in thing now. So you, you spoke uh, about ki, there is a um, uh, high patience uh, area where you need a lot of time. I think we, we are in the uh, maybe process, but it takes a long time. It needs a lot of uh, hard work into this and all that. So what, what is your prediction at this point of time? Um, by 2025, by 2030, uh, at what time we will be at least transferring a good amount of our um, critical science into AI-based? Uh, by what time is your prediction? See, it's the two things. In the, in the Western world where most of the thing is structured, Probably 2030, they can do a very good uh, job with AI, AI getting amalgamated into most of the systems. But in India, I still see a lack uh, because the main reason is ours is a very haphazard medical network. You have the excellent, uh, let us take in Hyderabad itself, you have a high end hospitals, you have medium, low end, and the data which is being stored and applied is at different levels. So probably if uh, high-end hospital like ours can buy some AI systems, a medium range, small range, they cannot buy because they don't have the supportive data. As I told you, like if the AI comes with a 3D mammogram, now that you cannot use that software, you cannot use in a small center. So you need to have an AI model which is developed with uh, the uh, three, uh, I forgot, the full plane uh, uh, mammogram and another uh, there are three uh, variants of mammograms. So each hospital carries data is different kind because of the cost. So uh, the other thing is the data what we are going to put in. So what kind of data you're going to put in. The high hospitals can have a good structured data whereas low the medium and low hospitals so things will not have a good data. Even if we develop some module to assess, uh, understand sepsis, now, you may require so many blood parameters to feed in, to tell, to predict. Now, that many blood parameters may not be possible in a small hospital, a small setup. So, that is a problem of deploying a product into the society. Now, once you can't bring it into society, it's going to restrict only to the big places. Now, once it's going to get restricted in big places, it's not going to make big difference. It's only a minor difference. So, in India, we have to restructure our entire uh, this thing. And that is the reason why Niti Aayog has uh, asked the technology institutes to structure data. Our biggest hurdle is unstructured data. So there are there are some software in the, maybe maybe in the last ten years I am come I came across many softwares including from IBM uh, to put across the all symptoms in a line with uh, from a patient and giving you a diagnosis according to the CDC and all. So what is that exactly and how it is linked uh, with uh, current AI? See, the problem with Watson, what happened when it started off initially is they uh, did a good job, but they started projecting that uh, you don't need a doctor. So that went bad against uh, with the doctor's community and they didn't start using it. Now, slowly, as the technology evolved, the same doctors are in need of it because I'll give an example of a simple thing. Let us take a CT scan in trauma. When a CT scan in trauma comes, uh, a, except for, uh, say, legal uh, considerations, 
the fracture of skull bone is not important for us, but it needs to be documented. Now, to identify fracture and CT scan, you need to waste a lot of time. So the radiologist, good amount of time is wasted in that. So there are a lot of AI models are coming to read fractures and the uh, radiologists can dedicate their time to understand the parenchymal injuries. So in that way, the stratification can happen. And then we keep working on such things. But in India, I still see it's a long time. It's not going to be that quick uh, or that easy. Okay. I think we have limitation of our time. Um, we had an interesting, probably out of box, out of pandemic, a new concept. And uh, I thank Dr. Karthik Munta who brought this topic to us and he enlightened on that. And uh, I thank Dr. BJ Rajesh uh, who had, uh, I believe now been an expert. Yeah, yes, sir. You go ahead. Just for winding up, my sincere request as I, most of the talks I keep telling is, uh, we have great doctors, we have great technology people. Now we are slowly having uh, uh, the technology coming up in the country. I request each and every doctor to spare 5 to 10% of their time to give innovative thoughts so that we can do indigenous things. Now, once we do indigenous things, the cost of the technology is going to drop down by, say, 50 to 100%. Now, that's going to make big difference and we can deploy it. So I request everyone to just give a small thought about uh, some innovative idea. And uh, there are many organizers like, like us, which we can take it forward. Yeah, That is the only main message from my side. Yeah, I, I request the young minds uh, who are working uh, or wanted to work on AI uh, can actually contact Dr. Bijay Rajas. As he pointed out, he took a long time to reach to a person who actually is an expert in AI. He can guide you. He can suggest you things. And um, probably we all also work around it and uh, get some fruitful, uh, helpful um, uh, outcomes out of AI in the, our future endeavor. And this will be helpful for our patients and all of us in the future. With this, I conclude the session and thanking all the participants for their active participation. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.